Um, suppose you set a challenge to yourself to reinvent the notion of school. Where would you start? Where, as an adult put uh, in charge of children in this world, where would you turn your attention? I have some advice for you. Start fooling around. I think that this is the source, the wellspring from which all great ideas come. And I would like to prove that to you through a little journey through my life. <clears throat> I am a master at fooling around. It can take me all day to empty a bucket of rainwater. I have balanced thousands and thousands of rocks. I take endless portraits of the little tiny creatures that visit my back porch at night. The creatures that sneak inside my house. And recently I took this picture of this beetle, an ordinary beetle with bright orange headlights. And when I offloaded these pictures to my computer, I discovered something interesting. This beetle had a passenger. It started this photo, I, I mailed it to an entomologist in Chicago at the Natural History Museum, and I said, what is going on here? He said, that little tiny orange mite has a phoretic relationship. I'd never heard of this. One of many forms of commensalism where organisms live next to each other but hardly know about each other. The mite is just getting a free ride to its next meal, and the beetle doesn't even know it's there. Something I never would have learned if I hadn't taken, been taking those pictures and sent it to that guy. I am a pathological doodler. In case you're wondering, this is what Ted looks like to me. And I love this quote from Andrew Bird here, where he says, what the world needs now is reckless curiosity. I think he's right. I think he's on to something. And these are my notes from a really important meeting about fundraising around my school. You can see how much detail I managed to capture. <laughs> I don't think rockets actually came up even once. I can make perfectly round balls of sand. It actually took me a couple of years to perfect this, but I can do it. I can teach you how to do it too. Mostly though, I tinker. I took about my camera. It wasn't working the way I wanted it to. I just opened it up, decided to change its behavior. I played with 2,000 little strawberry baskets for two days at the Exploratorium. I built sailboats in a weekend with a couple of kids. And I play with words. We have the audio? Have you ever read the book 50 Dangerous Things? Have you read 50 Dangerous Things? Nope. No. Uh, today we're doing topic number one. How to lick a 9-volt battery. Have you ever licked a 9-volt battery before? Have you ever licked a 9-volt battery before? No. No? No. 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 Have you ever licked a 9-volt battery before? And are you ready? Yes. Have, are you scared? Kind of. Do you want to try a fresh battery or an old battery? Are you scared? I know. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that's weird. That's, that's really weird. That's really weird. And what does it taste like when you're done? Mm. <laughs> it's amazing to me what you can get children to do on the street. <laughs> Play better. We can get better at this the more we practice. And the more we practice, the more creative we become. It becomes our natural mode uh, of, of uh, expression. I'll give you one more example, maybe more relevant to what Walter told you I would talk to you about. Um, six years ago, I started this school, uh, Tinkering School. It was a summer program for kids. And 
I started it because it seemed like kids weren't really getting a chance to work with real tools and real materials anymore and build real things. At least, that's the official story. It's, the, it's what I tell people, newspaper reporters and radio uh, talk show hosts, but the, it's not the full story. The true, the other aspect of this story is that I wanted to spend more time fooling around. And it turns out that children are just a lot better at it than most adults. <laughs> Five years later, we had a program that was doing everything I'd ever hoped, exceeding every expectation I had. We were getting some great projects done, but there was a problem, and it was that the kids weren't doing any of this stuff except at my school. They weren't going home and doing these kinds of things. They were waiting. I started to worry that it was because I was giving them all these exotic tools and materials to work with, and it was things they couldn't get at home. So I, the next year I set out, last year, I decided we would only work with sticks and string, materials that any child anywhere in the world could get a hold of. And we started building with these materials, a simple technique called lashing. And we built some incredible things again, giant three-story condominiums with this, this one has its own built-in hammock. But it still wasn't enough. They weren't going home and doing these things. And I was talking to my friends at the Exploratorium, a science museum in San Francisco, and, and I discovered they had the same problem. Kids come to the science museum, have these great experiences, and they're not at home thinking, oh, what could I do here to explore the idea of magnetism? to work with a chaotic pendulum. A great exhibit, a great science exhibit, has an average engagement of 46, 47 seconds. 47 seconds, and that's a great exhibit. I started to wonder if maybe I didn't, I didn't give enough of a context for these kids to become inculcated, to really immerse themselves in a culture of creating things from their own minds. And I started to wonder if we could expand our program. I started talking about it to my good friend, Brian Welch, who also runs a summer program. And we discovered in the conversation that he had the perfect peanut butter of curiosity-driven exploration to the chocolate of my hands-on building experience. And that between the two of them, we had the perfect candy bar. His school is based on engaging children in a curiosity-driven experience and giving the children charge of their own exploration. And we realized that his program would set them up perfectly for an opportunity in my program to build something or create something based on that exploration. This was our Pinocchio moment where we suddenly started to dream what if our school could become a real school, be a real place where children came instead of going to those sort of cells and bells prisons that, where they were going, a new place for education? Well, as it turned out, we had no idea what we were doing. We didn't even know if it was legal. It took us a couple of months to figure out that, it, yes, it was fine. You could open a building anywhere in San Francisco and invite kids in and call it a school. So then we had to figure out how it would work. And we began doodling. We began drawing different ways that it might work. And one day, almost seven months ago, we came up with the right solution. We had the right idea. And when we hit it, we knew it. We walked up from my studio that day, and we, we just knew. We said, this is it. This is the school. And I'd like to draw it for you here today. You ready? I'm just going to spread out my giant piece of brown paper. Now, if the normal pedagogical unit of a school is a day divided into seven periods of 45 minutes each, a little math, a little science, a little history, maybe some lunch crammed in there somewhere, not that much recess anymore, out time outside, we're not working on our curriculum, English, and if you're lucky, maybe some art in the afternoon. 
If that's the pedagogical unit of a traditional school, then our pedagogical unit is called the ARC. The ARC is anywhere between six and 12 weeks long, and every ARC has a topic. In this case, we're gonna use wind. We divide this ARC into three equal parts. Each part <laughs> has a specific purpose, a role in our pedagogy, and the first ARC, the first phase of the ARC is called exploration. And we transform our school into a landscape of uh, different areas where we look at this topic from different perspectives. And into this landscape, we bring experts, people who have dedicated a portion of their lives to some aspect of wind in this example. Power generation, we're gonna have somebody in who makes uh, windmills. Um, uh, somebody who's a sailor or studied nautical history during the age of wind power. Uh, artists who work with wind, who integrate wind in their sculptures, the motivating force. And meteorologists who look at wind based on the climate and how it affects uh, a, a given ecological zone in our local micrometeorology. And we take the kids on a curated journey through this landscape where they meet and work with these experts. And those experts share their passion with these kids. And when those kids find inspiration, they cluster up. And when they do that, we assign them an adult collaborator. And working with the adult collaborator, they create a declaration. This is what we're gonna work on in the next phase. It's a language arts moment where you learn how to express your ideas, your hopes and dreams in a way that will engage someone else and convince them it's an idea worth doing. This next phase, is called expression. We call it expression because it doesn't have to be building. We allow all forms of expression. Here we see a kind of iterative design build experience going on in this lower declaration and always against a deadline. There's a, there's a known end to this phase, just like in real life. There are certain constraints on the things we do and we do our best when we understand those constraints. A series of experiments designed to test a hypothesis about wind, Maybe a rock opera where we have to do some writing, do some set building, do some writing and some rehearsals. But whatever happens, we get to that end and we have something to show for it. And at the end, we have this phase. We call it exposition. Exposition, where we turn our school open outwards and we bring the public inside to see what we've done. And the children there, surrounded by the things of their creation and the demonstrations that they do, explain what it is they did and why, and handle those off-axis questions that come when a preschool comes and they say, why did you use PVC pipe to make your windmill? And the kids have to explain the decision process that got them there, perform their opera, and, and handle those questions, which causes them to examine their own motivation and understanding of the topic. When we have to tell somebody about what we know, we learn it better. And this also sets us up for a moment of reflection, where we look back on what we did and why we did it, and an introspective kind of analysis, which we record in a portfolio. Every project, every child has a portfolio for every project. And at the end, a little moment, a brief moment of rest. We don't dictate what we're gonna do in this period, it's just a little bit of downtime, because come the next Monday, we're gonna be off on a new ARC topic. In this experience, children at our school are going every year, five or six ARCs, five to seven ARCs. In a kindergarten through 12th grade, we're talking about something like 50 to 70 ideas taken from inspiration to completion, all recorded in a portfolio. When this child graduates, they get a, a, a stack that they take with them to a college or to a job. And they say, what did you do? Well, I did this. I built a car out of plastic. I turned you know, wheat into uh, fuel. I did this, I did that. And they have the documentation for this. 50 to 70 ideas taken to completion. What do any of us who graduated from regular public educations have to say for that time we spent in there well, I participated in a lot of after-school programs. I got an A, whatever that meant. My A doesn't mean anything like your A's. 
a different kind of education. I think it's time for this. I'm not sure we have it 100% right, but this is where we're going to start. And we're going to make it work because there's something in here that is as compelling as any other idea about education. And it looks like a lot more fun. It looks like a lot more play. It looks like a chance for children to exercise that part of their creative resource that they never get to use in regular high school, regular grammar school, where you have to find the answer. This is a picture from the opening ceremony of our new school. It'll be exactly 10 months from the moment we figured it out to the moment we opened the doors. We had 280 applications for, two, for 24 spaces at our school, an actual order of magnitude more student applications than we could handle. I think when it comes to education, it's time for us to be brave, to re-examine those assumptions that we have about what an education is and what the fundamental goal of our educational process is. Because we don't need another generation of kids who are really good at taking tests. What we need is generations of kids who see the really tough problems of the world as puzzles, and they have the tenacity the creative resources and the creative ability to solve those puzzles. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.